evening. I don't know when you're watching this. I'm Pastor Kelly and this is Pilgrim Congregational United Church of Christ online worship, which we've been doing because of the COVID pandemic since mid-March, like many other churches. We began initially with uh, an 11th hour decision to uh, cancel in-person worship in mid-March. And so I got up early that first Sunday morning, came to this back room in my home and uh, created a, maybe a 15 minute video with a message and some prayers and some uh, music I played on my, uh, on my computer. That's evolved. Uh, I began using iMovie and uh, uh, downloading different uh, music from our musicians and elsewhere, uh, adding slideshows and so forth. It, uh, it became um, about a 20 to 25 hour a week uh, effort. A lot of it was uh, learning what I was doing and um, Peg Calamia Downing at one point offered to support this work and has been doing it since Easter and uh, for which I am very grateful. So that means I can concentrate more on uh, the writing and recording of my sermon and collaborating on some parts of it but not putting it all together. Um, I now record on Thursdays. I'm sitting here with my mid-morning coffee. You may be able to hear uh, the faded sound of a lawnmower in the distance. And uh, there are many blooper reels where I'm mid-sentence and a package comes to our front door. I need to uh, turn it off and restart because the dog goes crazy or the kids are fighting. Uh, last week you may have heard a door close and I just decided to push through because it was the least amount of noise of all of the attempts I'd made. So, uh, I hope that worship, although we're not together yet, um, is nurturing for you and um, inspiring and leads you into time of reflection and prayer and communion with the divine. And know that in the meantime, we are working to um, look for ways to use the warm summer months to bring us together outdoors. And uh, for those who feel safe in doing so with distance and with masks, uh, to gather together and feed our, um, the social needs that we continue to have and remind ourselves um, that we're not alone even though we can feel alone these days. So I just wanted to share uh, those words with you and um, let you know what goes on behind the scenes and that um, while it's not ideal, I hope that you uh, feel the love that we have for one another, um, feel the love of God um, in these days and recognize that what you're doing to be the church uh, both with one another in the congregation and in the wider community. It matters. It is important. The church is not the building. It is us together, even as we're apart. So I'm with you in spirit. I miss you. And I hope you have a wonderful week. Our first reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 16 through 19, and then verse 25. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, but you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say, he has a demon. The son of man came along eating and drinking. And they said, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated in his deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Abba, God of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things 
from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, for such was your gracious will. reading from the book of Romans chapter 7 verses 15 to 25 I do not understand my own actions for I do not do what I want but I do the very thing I hate now if I do what I do not want I agree that the law is good but in fact it is no longer that I do it, but sin dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want to do is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer that I do not that I do it, but that sin that dwells within me does it. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law in my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched person that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I am a servant to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a servant to the law of sin.
Come to me, come to me, come to me, and I will give you rest. All who are weary, all who are burdened down, come to me, come to me, come to me, and I. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. The Apostle Paul confessed this to fellow believers in his letter to the young church in Rome. Long before Paul, the Dead Sea Scrolls referred to sin as having dominion over human flesh as if simply by being alive and enfleshed, one was constitutionally made to sin, to act in ways that disregard divine expectations. Paul is informed by that belief and argues the law is necessary to keep our sinful impulses in check, and that with baptism, believers are released from spiritual captivity to sin, though still imperfect. Listen again to Paul's struggle as he explains it. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. If we're honest with ourselves, we probably all have shared that sentiment from time to time. It's why confession and forgiveness has such an important place in Christian life. But unlike Paul, who says, I do not understand my own actions, today we have the benefit of science to help us better understand human nature and lend insight to our behaviors and actions, including the ones we're not fond of. In June, National Geographic published a piece by Rebecca Renner that captured my attention with the title, Why Some People Can't Resist Crowds Despite the Pandemic. Renner writes that an evolutionary paradox that compels us to be social may be to blame. Millions of years ago, our primate ancestors found safety in cooperation developing social structures that protected them from predators and increased the likelihood of survival for them and their offspring. As early primate communities became more complex, so did our ancestors' brains, which evolved to process social interactions and reward social behavior with positive neurochemical feedback loops. Because we humans can become addicted to the feel-good chemicals produced in our bodies when we're gathered, Renner says that our current efforts to social distance requires overcoming our primal impulse to convene, going against millennia of evolutionary programming. Given that we're hardwired to socialize for our emotional well-being, it makes sense that this ongoing restriction has been so difficult for us. It might lend compassionate insight into Jesus's lament about the people in his discourse in Matthew. Leading up to this, it may help to know that John the Baptist had just been imprisoned and he was about to be killed by Herod. John was a relative of Jesus who had proclaimed the Messiah was coming 
and urged people to retent, repent, to turn from old and destructive ways, be baptized and prepare their hearts for the one who would come. But people misjudged John. They maligned him. They watched him fast as a spiritual discipline, then villainized him for not eating. Then along came Jesus, eating and drinking as everyone else, and they called him a drunkard. It appears that nothing could once and for all satisfy or convince people with shallow, unexamined religious expectations. People who in theory had wanted a Messiah, but in reality had rejected everyone truly godly. Nothing was enough to convince them. John was sent to prison, though innocent, and after him, Jesus was harassed too, criticized, and eventually crucified. Yet, Jesus says, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Wise deeds bear out as true and righteous. They stand the test of time. This spring, wisdom's vindication was our hope when we stayed home to keep one another safe and slow the spread of COVID-19. All along, hot debate took place across the country about what should open and what should be closed and what was truly essential, which for different people meant different things. People took to the streets to rally for hair salons to open. Now, this week, it's the right to socialize in bars, even in communities where the virus is increasing at alarming rates. People want to mingle, to convene. As Renner acknowledges, we are hardwired to desire and enjoy convening. With time, many of us have cautiously moved from sheltering in place, out of our homes and hesitantly into public spaces, going into parks, stores, protests, the occasional outdoor patio or the garden of friends, keeping watch for crowds, maintaining distances, masking, but slowly, selectively, learning to feed our social needs in safer ways that tend to our well-being. Renner's scientific perspective in National Geographic does share some good news. It is the news that our best chance for COVID recovery can be found in another trait that we humans have developed with evolution. And that is altruism and the desire to protect one another. From a faith perspective, we might call that kind of altruism loving our neighbors as ourselves. We first find the love commandment in Deuteronomy mandated by God for the Israelites as they established a community that would reflect divine compassion and care in their own community, community and their ways and living. We see altruism today in our commitment to distance and mask and our concern for and support of neighbors and church members and folks in our communities. We can be heartened by the dedication of healthcare workers who face so many challenges, often many tragedies and trials in their day-to-day -day efforts to treat, treat the sick and send them home healthy. Altruism can be found all around us. It can be found in the outpouring of community members to support Black Lives Matter, or to stand with a neighbor being harassed because of race, or to take part in pride or other human rights work. Last weekend, I learned that my hometown of Tiffin, Ohio, had a Trans Lives Matter event with dozens of people, if not more, at the county courthouse, just weeks after their first Black Lives Matter event, which brought a large turnout. If you knew Tiffin as I remember it and know it, you would have cried like I cried. Tears of gratitude and gladness a heart full of hope as I saw friends standing on those streets with signs.
for love of their neighbor. Altruism can be found in so many people, in so many places, if only we're looking for it. And it lives within us as well. On this Independence Day weekend, I'd like to think altruism in our collective life across this country is manifest in the rising up of people with good hearts, with genuine care for their neighbors, people who recognize that liberty and equal opportunity in our land does not belong to everyone in this moment. People who love their neighbors enough to try to change that. Altruism clothed in Christian faith is the loving of others as we love ourselves. It is a good Samaritan way of being, the caring for others simply because their need for care is evident. In the book of Pro Proverbs, altruism is a desirable facet of a wise and faithful person, a quality one desires and aspires to possess. Jesus embodies that altruism, and he is the embodiment of divine wisdom. We find it in his words and actions, and we can find it elsewhere, even in his self-descriptions, as in, I am the way, I am the living water, I am the bread of life. Jesus is that wise rabbi embraced already by some as the long awaited Messiah. Wisdom, he says, is vindicated by her deeds. Jesus is divine wisdom and he ultimately is vindicated by his deeds. Right after this, Jesus issues an invitation to his listeners perhaps sensing the burden of those who believe in him who are already contending with angry skeptics and accusers. So to those making an effort to follow his way of wisdom and altruism, despite the adversity that faces them, Jesus says this, come to me, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He invites them to rest. Jennifer Calland, professor of religious studies at Iona College in New York writes this, Jesus offers respite for the weary, but what we can miss here is that Jesus is also highlighting the importance of instruction. Though we think of a yoke as equipment for an animal. The term was often used in rabbinic literature to refer to the task of obedience to the Torah. In order to obey the divine law, you must know the law. Jesus wants those who are burdened to learn from him. His gentle instruction will enable you to find rest for your soul, to find wholeness and completion. Jesus's guidance is not harsh or arrogant, and therefore obedience to the word should be easy. Jesus' invitation is instructive. Wisdom enables self-reflection. Getting to know Jesus helps us to know ourselves better. Our pursuit of following Jesus is at the same time, she says, a pursuit of wisdom. Several scholars also emphasize the first person pronouns, come to me, take my yoke, which should confirm for us that we're not alone in our ministries or faith journey. What we carry is Christ's yoke, Christ's burden. It was never meant to be ours. So, hence the invitation to lay down your burdens Knowing the tasks and work of ministry always awaits. God knows they're never finished once and for all, and I need to hear the words of Jesus as much as you. May we listen carefully to what Jesus speaks. 
and in so doing, give ourselves permission to step back when we're weary, to rest and to reflect on our lives, our efforts, and our world through the lens of Christ's wisdom and altruistic way. We are hardwired to crave togetherness. We are also hardwired to desire to protect one another. We can rely on that desire and on the love commandment of Jesus to keep us making the effort to engage safely in a time of pandemic and to care for our neighbors as ourselves. We will continue to make mistakes, do and say things we regret because we are human and always will be. But wisdom invites continual self-reflection and growth. And Christ offers and embodies the altruism to which we aspire. And in the meantime, grace is poured out. Mercy abounds. Thanks be to God. We come to our tables not because we must, but because we may. These tables where divine mystery meets human hunger. We gather around our individual tables to taste and see the God who commanded us to love. We pause to honor with tender memory the holy table in our church home and to consecrate with love for all God's children these many holy tables in our home churches. Let us pray together our communion prayer. Gentle host, rest upon us as you rested upon water and light, earth and creatures, human beings, all in your image and holy Sabbath, Send your spirit of life and love, power and blessing upon your children who are staying at home so that this bread may be broken and gathered in love and this cup poured out to give hope to all. Risen Christ, live in us that we may live in you. Breathe in us that we may breathe in you. Amen. We remember that on the night before Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, gave thanks, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I invite you all to raise your hands over your elements. Therefore, by your Holy Spirit, Bless these gifts of bread and juice. And now I invite you to turn your hands towards the screen and bless us that as we receive them, we may offer you our faith and praise. We may be united with Christ and with one another, and we may continue faithful in all things. Through the broken bread, we experience the body of Christ.
through the cup of blessing, we participate in the new life Christ gives. The gifts of God for the people of God. All things are ready. As we partake of the bread, remember, this is the body that is broken for you. Take and eat. And as you take your cup, remember this is the cup of the new covenant. Let us join together in our prayer of thanksgiving. O oh, Holy One, our tongues have tasted the good news, and our lives are filled with the spirit that hovered over creation and blew fresh hope on Pentecost. Creator, open our hearts. Word, seek peace in our voices to all the people in all the hot spots and hurts of the world. As we journey masked, through our lonely or dangerous or over busy day, Holy Spirit, fill us with this blessing that it is good. Amen. I invite. God, true.